Chapter Ten. Instantly, I come to. The shock is sudden, and my body strains from the freezing water entering my lungs. My blood turns cold, and my limbs go numb, twisting and tumbling like a rag doll through rushing currents, crashing into rocks. It is too cold to feel anything. Panic summons every ounce of energy I have. As I search for the surface, dark water stings my eyes. All I see is decayed life trapped at the bottom of the river. Animals, humans, all rotted to skeletons. I am running out of air. My chest is about to burst. My arms and legs move me upward, but I feel nothing. I break the surface, air rushing into my lungs. My body bobs up and down like a buoy until it comes to rest between two rocks. Wedged in a crook, the rage of the river assaults me, splashing my face, drowning me without mercy. Pain returns as blood flows back into my body, shoulder pierced, face shredded, both throb with burning cold. My whole body shakes. I can't see the sky, but I know the bleak of twilight is not far off. Thick mist obscures everything above the cliff. The high wall disappears into nothingness. I hear howling in the distance. Pulling myself onto the rocks, I cough <coughs> and discharge the rest of the water from my lungs. My head spins from looking around, and my vision blurs with hues of red and yellow, distorting anything I see. Souls burn all around me. Has death come for me? No, I faced it before. This is different somehow. Tentacles reach for me. Hellish claws grope at my skin. What are they? Stay away from me! I shout, choking on more water. I cough and shake my head to rid myself of illusionary visions. The wounds on my body burn badly. The water, no doubt, mixed with the blood, is heightening my pain. This is the river of Faust, the cursed river that flows uphill instead of down, raging on to the evil at the base of Iglesian's ruins. The qualities of the water staunch the blood of my wounds, yet I feel myself going mad. I squeeze the temples of my forehead in desperation, and the visions finally fade. Where's the carriage? There is a wooden wheel on the opposite bank. My heart sinks. No one could have survived the fall into the ravine. Yet here I am, alert and very much alive. The feeling of loss consumes me. Everything I fought for up to this point came to nothing. And then, realization sets in. I am utterly alone. Kronklik, Bronin, Manson. My thoughts become darker at the thought of having lost the boy Manson, left to the wilderman to tear his flesh from his tiny bones. I was his angel, his guardian of hope, but I am no angel. I wonder if God is above, amused, watching me, watching me fail, seeing what I aim to do next. But it is not He who I sense watching me. Something else is here, some presence I cannot describe. There is a creeping mist moving along the bank of the river, covering the ground like a cloud covers the sky. Within the sinister energy, I see eyes with stalks swaying above mossy mounds of green and brown, clinging to rocks and stones like snails. There are life forms that once served as sentinels for Iglesian, their purpose now long forgotten. I stare at a patch of eyes close to me. And they never blink; they are always watching. So I look away. I am cold and can't stop shivering. Slowly I stand up from the slick rocks, and I nearly tumble back into the black water. I catch myself and stagger. The eye moss follows my every move. The land along the bank is clear of debris, clear of things that might have been thrown from the carriage. No wood, no weapons, no bodies. 
I make a quick inventory of what I have left and find my situation grim. Aside from the proofing strapped to my body, my only other possession is the Bowaka blade strapped to my hip. I thank myself for not using it on the carriage. I move along the bank following the, the flow of the river as my guide. High walls on both sides. I am trapped animal, vulnerable among the sparse trees and open rock face. Thoughts of my dead companions are all that can comfort my loneliness. Despite the amount of water inhaled, my lips are parched and my throat is dry. I stare at the water rushing by and force myself to look away. What is my preference for ways to die? From madness or from thirst? Focus, Tenor. You need to find Dorian. He's the only thing left on this earth that matters to you. Limping, I stagger along slanted crags, eyeing the river as if it were some great beast. It goes on forever in either direction. There is no choice. Lingering in this wilderness after dark is certain death. So I press on, staring at, at rock after rock. I notice the more steps I take, the easier it becomes to walk. And with the cold having reached my inner core, walking is all I can do to keep from freezing to death. Bones line the path as it narrows to an almost impossible pass. Scattered about, they are human, having succumbed most likely to a similar fate as mine. One corpse, still wholly together, holds on to its patches of leathery skin, its clothes worm-ridden over time, a dead man never to speak his tale. I wonder at the strangest of the silence all around me. There is neither sounds of birds nor the howl of the wolves anymore. Even the songs of insects are absent. There is only the melody of the river. My progression comes to a halt as the path runs out. In its place, before me lies a massive landslide of boulders and sharp rocks, the result of the cliff eroded away over time. I dread the thought of having to backtrack the way I came, or to ford the, forge the river. Moving to the edge of the black water, I stand on a flat rock to gain better perspective. A particularly large mass of eye moss is grouped together near the shore. As I move closer, their eyes focus on me. But I ignore their eyes. It is their mossy roots in which I take interest. They are clumped together and trail to the edge of the river. Cautiously, I maneuver myself along the slick rocks and find myself standing before a natural bridge protruding from the swirling water. Pieces of it have eroded away over time. Boot over boot, I advance, knowing one wrong move will send me spilling into the drink. Halfway across, I hear low croaking sounds coming from the water. They grow louder and louder. White eyes appear in the black churning water. I am acutely aware I need to get off these rocks. Adrenaline taking over my physical pains, I do all I can to make myself less of a target. There is a splash followed by several more, and my nerves tell me to duck. I am sprayed with cold water as hundreds of small fish-like creatures arc over my shoulders through the air. One of them doesn't return to the water. It flops around violently on the rock, struggling to upright itself onto its two hind legs. Peering at me with one eye sideways, it turns to face me, revealing a row of interlocking teeth down the center of its flat face. I view what seems to be a cross between a fish and a frog. Opening its mouth, a worm-like tongue slithers between its razor points, licking the rock before it. Their gellies. Immediately I stand up and charge, kicking the blasted thing back into the river. As I attempt to run, I slip with each step, nearly falling into the black liquid. The gellies become louder. They are relentless, lobbing their bodies at me from the water, forcing me to move ahead recklessly. I need to get to land. The end of the bridge is in sight. I hop over a crumbled rock, advance a step, then two, and suddenly the final rock I step on gives, causing pebbles and moss to strip away into the water. I bend my knees and leap, pushing my boots off whatever foundation is left. 
There is a large splash, and I find myself tumbling in dust and dirt. The gellies are all around me, and grunt with excitement. There are too many to count. Their flat faces glisten with moisture, and their bellies expand like frogs. Leveling the boaca to the ground, I send it arcing away from my body. The blade carves its way through countless ranks of amphibian creatures. One is pierced while another is tossed aside. The attack is direct and effective, creating a temporary gap in the mass of chaos. A gelly leaps from my face. With free hands I catch stopping it from gouging my face. With the bawaka returning to me, I immediately toss it away, catching the spinning blade with precision. Instead of throwing it a second time, I use it to swipe low at my boots as I hasten to get away. Gellies split apart by my feet and I run for sanctuary. The gellies are much slower on land than water, and soon there is distance between us. I am out of breath and my legs burn. With only the sound of the river rushing by, I am convinced they have given up pursuit. I slow to a walk, keeping my distance from the edge of the water. Being in the shadow of the ravine with the sun nearly set, the temperature has dropped significantly. Desperation sets in as my body continues to shake uncontrollably. Movement has become crucial to my immediate survival. The only thing keeping me from losing consciousness is the ache of my muscles and the desire to live. Through the thick mist, a large, dark mass grows in size. The need for caution escapes me. I can't stop walking or I will fall over. For what I thought was some new obstacle to overcome, the dark mass soon gives way to a large, gaping hole in the side of a hill. The river ascends into darkness through an iron gate filtering items swept away by the water. Loose debris trapped at its base forms a tumbling collection of garbage. For a moment, I cringe at the thought that my way is barred, but I realize there is a door ahead, halfway ajar. With its hinges rusted, I ponder its open state. A strong breeze blows from somewhere above me, causing the mist to clear from the ground. That is when I notice the bodies. Rotten and decomposed, their mouths are open with maggots dripping from the orifices of their once discernible faces. Worms slither from hollow sockets. Roaches clamor over articles of clothing. There are five of them, all bearing weapons except for the ones without limbs. Swords, maces, they seem to have belonged to some sort of raiding party. Vagabonds, gypsies, hunters, it does not matter their previous charge. They are all equals in death. I stumble and fall before one of the stinking corpses, one much larger than the rest. Most of the body is still intact. There is still blue jelly residue in the sockets, spared from the pecking of ravens. A stream of maggots trails from the nostrils to the large gaping hole in the side of its neck. Some of its provisions are still intact. Pushing away a rat, I rummage through a small satchel lying next to the dead body. Despite the gore, my mouth waters at the thought of sustenance. Stale bread? Dried corn? Anything will do. The bag is nearly empty save for a leather skin, a dried pork strip and some oiled, soiled torches. Maybe I won't die in this miserable place after all. Cracked fingers from the cold moisture prevent me from gripping the cork and the leather skin, so I use my teeth. Its supple release from the inside graces my lips with stale water that never tasted so good. Sitting back on the haunches of my thighs, I savor my brief moment of reprieve, yet the cold doesn't let me linger for for long. Unfastening the cloak from the corpse's neck, I discard my own and place my new salvation around my shoulders. It smells of decay, but its warmth I welcome. Suddenly, Diana enters my thoughts. My memory of her comforts me in this wicked time. I look around with heavy heart, but the mist offers me nothing. I pull the cloak tighter around me. 
There is a necklace hanging from the corpse's neck. Sitting for a moment, I stare at it, shaking my head. Reaching forward, I yank the cross, snapping the leather tie. The sudden force slumps the body forward, stirring more roaches and rancid smells. Taking deep breaths, I dry, I dry heave and stagger away to the riverside, trinket swaying in my trembling fingers. I manage to keep the pork stripped down as I hold the silver cross out in front of me, rubbing the dew from it, wondering if the power of God resides somewhere inside its tiny form. Maybe because I'm beyond exhaustion or starving to death, my mind wanders. Suddenly, I am standing in the throne room of Lord Iglesian years ago, right before the fall of his castle. I had come by my personal... By... Try that again. I had come by personal invitation, obliging his request to bring one artifact that men killed for, the hand of God. He wanted nothing more than to be human again, to give up the curse he carried for so long. He would repent, and God would be merciful. As Iglesian took the relic from my hand, I witnessed the mercy God provided. All the years of life granted to Iglesian fell upon him at once. After 2,000 years of being cursed, in that fleeting moment, Iglesian became human. But quick as the transformation took place, so did his flesh decay. I watched his bones crumble to dust. Did he know, or was he tricked? I still can't wrap my head around it. Such was God's mercy, but was it mercy? I stare beyond the cross now, focusing on the tendrils of water, churning rapidly against the rocks. The water flows like blood of a man's veins, disappearing into the rusty bars of the gate, disappearing into nothingness, deep in the hole of the cliff. It is death that waits for us in the end, always has been. I clench the cross in my fist, as if trying to crush the holiness out of it. Everyone I have ever loved has died, everyone but one, and the chance he still lives is beyond reason. I am a madman now, searching for my son. I will save him from that bastard Jochum. I can't wait for God to give me guidance. Temperance has left me. I let the cross slip from my hand and it falls into the river. I wait a moment listening for something, but nothing happens. Things are quiet and the silence adds to my feeling of emptiness. I push my damp hair from my face, tucking it behind my ear. Looking up, I want to see stars, so I pretend I see them through the mist that obscures everything. Night approaches and I can barely see my hand. Remembering the torches in the dead corpse's satchel, I turn to retrieve them before I run out of things to see. The mist filters the light like a black cloth. The thought of fire invigorates me. Groping through the fading light, I hear the squeak of scattering rats, and my hand falls around leather just as it becomes pitch black. Placing the bag over my shoulder, I remove one of the torches and begin striking stones together. Three taps and the oil catches. A burst of flame lights up the night and prevents the darkness from swallowing me. The light is blinding. It takes a moment for my eyes to adjust. And when they do, I stand firm, wondering if my eyes are playing tricks on me. The hairs on my arms rise. I am no longer alone.